Speaking about Larry, I think uh, maybe you don't realize, Larry, but you have been very important uh, in my life, at least for two things. Uh, scientifically, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, not immediately, when I was uh, for two years in Oxford, I didn't work on blind sight. But uh, your uh, influence was very strong, and when I went back to Italy, I started thinking about working on blind side. The second, more personal, that um, I mm, was supposed to go to work in Australia at an Australian National University with uh, Pio Bishop, who was, uh, I would say, uh, the opposite of your, <laughs> of your attitude. He was a uh, a neurophysiologist was actually a sort of rival of Jubel and Weasel, and he had a, a very highly specialized recording lab for recording single unit from cats. Everything was parametric, and working very well, and I was supposed to stay at least three years. Then you came to visit the lab in Pisa, the Institute of Psychology, of Physiology, Pardon, and I was with Giovanni Berlucci's group, and uh, we took you around in, for a trip around Tuscany, uh, from to Siena, and, uh, and during the, the the trip we were always talking about <laughs> science, about um, also about blind sight and so on. So after that, I said, well, the hell with Australia, I go to Oxford. <laughs> and actually, you, I asked you to, if I could come, and you say, well, yes, you are welcome, but not this year, next year. <laughs> so I, I, I was waiting for a year, and then I stayed uh, there for two years. And the second reason for impacting on my life is that my daughter was born in Oxford. So she's a British subject and now is out. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, she's not allowed to, to come home. She has to, <laughs> to show a passport. They are only, you know, her only passport is actually English because she didn't bother to get an Italian passport because the procedure was too long, whereas with the British passport was very fast. Anyway, so thank you for all this. Um, now, um, um, the outline of the talk, I will briefly speak about uh, comparing the indirect uh, and uh, direct uh, uh, paradigm. As you know, th these are the two main approach to studying blind sight. One is the direct force choice, which was actually uh, initiated by, by Larry in which the subject is actually confronted with a choice. Uh, is it a cross or a circle? A typical response is, I, I see nothing, yeah, okay, make a choice, and so The indirect, instead, is the influence of uh, an unseen stimulus presented to the blind field on perception of in the good field. So the advantage of the indirect is that uh, there is no question of uh, guessing or not, because the patient, every trial, he can see the stimulus, and he is not aware that uh, present simultaneous presentation of another stimulus in the blind field may or may not influence uh, his performance. And it's a sort of no-report paradigm, so in a sense, because the subject, I will speak about this later. One of the uh, paradigms that I've been using uh, is the so-called redundant signal effect or redundant target effect, and I will talk about this. Uh, and then uh, I will go to a bit more perhaps interesting things, like the question of whether blind sight is sensitive to relatively complex perceptual effect, like Gestalt kind of effects. Finally and briefly, because the, the work is still uh, at the beginning, uh, we are speak about uh, electrophysiological recording from uh, stimuli presented to the, to the blind field. So, uh, report paradigm, as you know, uh, enable one to correlate uh, phenomenological experience, uh, at least uh, as far as it described 
the way is described by the subject, with the neural variables, but of course are susceptible to intrusion by post-perceptual processes. This is something which has been discussed in the last years a lot. And of course, uh, uh, my reporting of experience is not only related to the stimulus, but is related to what memory, attention, emotion, and other things. On the contrary, the no-report paradigms are less susceptible to such intrusions, but they may test uh, different perceptual processes. So the two things do not necessarily witness the same kind of uh, process. So practically, one might say, might say that uh, one should do them together. The redundant signal effect, I'm sorry for the people who have heard this many times, is uh, actually, but I see many young people, I don't think they, have, uh, they know much about it. It's a simple reaction time paradigm to either single or double visual stimuli presented uh, either a uh, single one on the, the left or the right or double stimuli. Invariably, it's one of these behavioral uh, <clears throat> tests in which uh, they are gratifying because uh, practically every subject shows the effect. And the reaction time is typically faster with two stimuli. And in fact, uh, that's called also summation effect uh, or something like this. Uh, this can be considered as an indirect uh, no-report paradigm, as I said, because uh, the subject usually are not even uh, aware that they are faster with the two stimuli. There are basically two models. One is a race model in which suppose that each signal is uh, conveyed by a channel, and the two channel, two or three channel, are uh, independent, and so the faster one wins the race and triggers reaction time. So the two, there is no interference between the two. It's a probabilistic effect. You know? The probability that more stimuli, uh, there is, with more stimuli there is one faster, it's uh, higher. The coactivation models which have been uh, uh, advocated mainly, but many people, mainly by Jeff Miller, Instead, uh, hypothesize uh, an interaction between the two or more channels, a neural interaction, so these are called also neural models. And uh, the key for these models is that the reaction time is faster than the fastest reaction time uh, of the single um, uh, stimuli. So there must be something more than simple probability. And Jeff Miller has developed uh, an algorithm, uh, uh, the no violation of the disequation algorithm that I'm not certainly going to, it's not difficult actually, but uh, which allows to decide whether a result is due to probability summation or to neurosummation. Actually, they are, the two are not exclusive because uh, with uh, some collaborator, and one is here, Silvia Savazzi, uh, we have found that under certain circumstances, uh, you, may, you, you may obtain uh, a probability effect uh, or a, a coactivation effect. The interest uh, for me started uh, about, uh, well, let's say now it's an uh, anniversary because it's uh, 30 years old, so it's a new, a new, a new result. Uh, when uh, together with Giancarlo Tassinari, Salvatore Agliotti, and Lodovico Lutzenberger in Pisa, we did uh, something which was uh, suggested in part by Giovanni, as usual. There is always uh, in our work some uh, direct or indirect participation of Giovanni. And the idea was to uh, present uh, uh, the redundant target effect to a Bianopi pesce. So in, in the, in, uh, in this patient, for instance, uh, clearly uh, having a myanopia on the left side, his perception of a right stimulus is, is identical to this one. And the idea was to see whether they, even though they see always one stimulus, 
they are still faster with double steel. And this is the case, not in many, because this system is very, this test is very conservative. Uh, we don't find uh, tens of blindside people. We only find one or two out of ten. I mean, it's very conservative. At that time, we, we speculated about the possible site of submission, and the superior colliculus came out immediately because of several reasons. First of all, it's known to have a relatively large visual receptive fields, uh, and uh, we know that uh, the uh, submission effect uh, is not very retinotopic. The two stimuli they can be in different position, not always symmetrical. It can be one here, one there. So this fits with a, a not very strict retinotopy. And then uh, uh, it's very sensitive uh, to multimodal stimuli. So for instance, uh, an acoustic and, and the visual stimulus uh, yield a very robust uh, redundant effect. And, uh, and uh, Elisabetta, Aladavas, and Bea, uh, they have uh, they know well this point. They have uh, done studies with multimodal visual acoustic stimuli. Um, they delay, uh, sorry, it's an Italian intruding. Uh, I would say a very robust evidence uh, about the superior colliculus that the redundant single effect uh, may survive uh, hemispherectomy. And, uh, and I'll show you evidence. So the simple idea is that there is a, an interaction between the two fields at the level of the intercollicular commission, so subcortically. And then, of course, the signal is relayed to uh, extra stride cortex uh, uh, and other structure. But the key intrahemispheric uh, uh, transfer should be at level of uh, inter, uh, subcortical level. <clears throat> and the work with hemispherectomy uh, subject was done in Canada with Francesco Tomaiolo, the two brothers, Tito brothers, and uh, Thomas Paus. And we found that uh, two out of four hemispherectomy patients uh, showed uh, this kind of blind sight with, uh, with uh, uh, so they showed the redundant signal effect uh, with, uh, uh, the, like the other immunopics. And this, of course, rules out uh, the cortical contribution. I will go back with this later on. Another way to show the importance of the superior collision was to use a stimuli which uh, apparently uh, to which apparently the superior collision is not sensitive. That is uh, as cones, short wavelength cones. And uh, there is evidence, uh, neurophysiological evidence, that uh, the superior colliculus is very, uh, are very scanty or absent cells sensitive to, to as cones input. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, so we, we presented the purple stimuli, which a mix a bit of uh, maybe of red, but it was mainly blue cone, <clears throat> and uh, at least three papers confirmed that the blind sight uh, uh, disappears with purple. In our case, also with red stimuli, this was uh, something to be, we will pursue further in another experiment. Then with Marco Tamietto and uh, uh, other, including Goebel and uh, Larry and Bea, we, mainly thanks to, to Marco, we uh, obtain evidence that uh, while with white stimuli the there was a selective uh, superior colligular activation studied with fMRI by subtracting uh, uh, redundant stimuli uh, to, from uh, single stimuli, anyway, done, after having done the proper subtraction, when you use, uh, there was, by the way, no selective activation in other subcortical areas. No, nothing in pulvinar, nothing in LGN. When we use the purple stimuli, then uh, no behavior advantage was present. 
in uh, um, patient uh, uh, GI in particular, and uh, as well as in uh, normal subject. And uh, so we thought that uh, it was uh, an explanation rather convincing that the superior colliculus is necessary for blind sight, at least uh, as far as uh, uh, intrahemispheric transfer is concerned, of course. Now, the, the next, uh, perhaps more interesting question is whether if uh, interhemispheric interaction that in this task are necessary for the summation effect uh, are also sensitive to perceptual effect like numerosity detection, grouping effects, binding, and the other gestalt uh, uh, phenomena. And uh, of course, the relation between uh, conscious and feature binding uh, has been discussed a lot. I was impressed by a recent paper by Kaiser, Hommel, and Lamme in which they found the spontaneous binding between orientation and location of a Gabor patch uh, occurred uh, not only consciously but also unconsciously. So which gives uh, the idea that uh, some, something important can occur also even uh, without consciousness. Uh, and consciousness is not a necessary condition for binding. So I would venture to say that this can apply to Gestalt phenomena. And uh, with Alessia Celeguin, that uh, is one of the organizers, Silvia Savazzi, and uh, Marisa Barabas, who is in Tübingen now with the group of Carnat, <clears throat> the Bendini is a neuroradiologist in Treviso. Uh, we found that uh, in uh, this time it was a group effect, a group study with amyanopics with different kind of uh, lesion, but all with a complete uh, homonymous amyanopia, either left or right side. And uh, one thing among the, mo the many checks that we did uh, was that we uh, done by the neuroradiologist with full visual field stimulation uh, there never found uh, activation of the, uh, the visual cortex uh, controlational uh, sorry activation was restricted to the controlational visual cortex so even with flooding uh, uh, checkerboard and the whole field uh, the visual cortex in the, in the ipsilisional side was not uh, activated. Now, the idea was to see whether increasing the number of stimuli to be summated was uh, uh, yielded a, a, an increase in the, in the redundant single effect. And we used two stimuli configuration, a gestalt-like one and a randomized, what means the single stimuli obviously was a dot, either single or double. The four stimuli could be either organized as a diamond, single or double, or just randomly uh, disorganized, not forming a good gestalt. And the, uh, the idea was to compare, look, if you look at the, this is the normal field, uh, the, um, by keeping uh, the stimuli, the number of stimuli in the good field uh, always uh, constant, that is one, we increased the number of stimuli in the bad field, either nothing, one, or four. And uh, or four in the good field, nothing, one, and four. And we found uh, something clear. If you look at the uh, reaction time, uh, by comparing uh, those uh, uh, stimuli. So for instance, uh, always the one stimulus in the good field and uh, zero, one, or four. Can you see that either with one in the good field or four in the good field, there was a, a clear effect of speeding, which was not present with the random, randomized stimuli. It, there was a clear cut difference. So apparently in the gestalt, the gestalt uh, I call it gestalt, you could call it uh, structured form or what you want, but uh, the difference was clear. Uh, 
So, uh, something, a few things about basic gestalt. I mean, uh, the theory of basic gestalt uh, uh, hypothesizes that when two or more parts of a perceptual group, uh, when they form a perceptual group, uh, a new emergent feature appears. And these are, in this case, the emergent feature is a diamond, of course. It could be something else. And uh, the emergent feature, of course, are, occur when parts of other elements assemble into configuration that are different from the sum of their parts and are often more perceptually salient and perceived more quickly and accurately. Now, more recently, again with Alessia Celeguin and uh, with the, again with uh, some of the Canadian collaborators as well as Marco, we did a similar, as, sorry, we did an experiment with two hemispherectomy patients who have shown blind sight in other tasks and, uh, and see whether they are sensitive to gestalt uh, uh, effects. The difference with the previous uh, stimulus is uh, there are two differences important that the uh, gestalt configuration were different whereas in the first study were always the diamond here there were forms, good forms but different at least four or more different forms and then the other were the randomized uh, thing and we in the two uh, patient, uh, and you can see that they don't have uh, much of the other hemispherectomized hemisphere, but the superior colliculus is there. And uh, there, in this case, there was a monocular presentation for two reasons. One is very, is very trivial, that one of the two patients had a slight uh, deviation of the eye, they didn't control very well one eye. So we cover that eye in this one and in the other one. The second is that uh, both had, uh, were covered uh, the right eye and, uh, and they had uh, the right hemispherectomy. So which means that the nasal, uh, the nasal retina, that is the temporal field, which is uh, supposed to be more represented in the superior colliculus, was the one which went uh, to the uh, to the superior colliculus surviving a semispherectomy, whereas the nasal field, that is the temporal retina, which uh, has a, a weaker input to the uh, colliculus, uh, goes to the normal side. This was to balance out a bit, not to have uh, two widely strong, strongly different inputs. And in fact, uh, 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 the c comparison were all clear. The single stimuli yielded a, a slower reaction time in all cases. So there was an, an overall effect of numerosity. However, with the post-hoc analysis, we found that the bilateral redundancy gain was clearly and reliably higher for the, for the gestalt configuration. And also we applied uh, a non-parametric uh, Miller disequation using the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test with a, in the cumulative uh, probability. And you can see that in both patients, uh, the red, especially in DR, but also in, uh, in well, let's say, especially in SAE, they, ne they never actually cross so the two distribution were actually uh, very um, different. And also with a non-parametric Kolmogorov, we found a reliable uh, effect with the Gestalt uh, thing. Now, uh, uh, how much time? Six minutes. How much? Six. Six minutes. Let's make seven. Uh, so what, one could ask uh, what pathways might subserve the interhemispheric interaction. There was a, a, some years before, again in, in, in Canada, 
again, uh, Alain Tito and his collaborator, uh, did uh, um, fMRI, uh, did, did uh, DTI in, uh, in, in this uh, hemispherectomy patient and found that uh, those patients, uh, I, I give you only one, two examples, patients with type 1 blind sight uh, had uh, important uh, connection between uh, the projection from the superior colliculus on the bad side to the hemisphere on the good side. And this was not the case, this is a comparison with the healthy side. This is from the uh, hemispheric to my side. In the patient without type 1 blind sight, uh, as you can see, there were no projection, or at least very, very small. So clearly in this brain, which of course admittedly they are they have been, uh, had been uh, semispherectomized many, many years before. So there must be, uh, like in GY, has been shown by Alan Cowie and uh, Holly Bridge, and so that there, are, there is a rearrangement of connection. But at least the pathway may be, may be that. Now, uh, neural correlate with uh, Francesco Marini, who has, is, was a postdoc one year in my lab and now is in uh, San Diego. Uh, we did an event related potential uh, with normal people, I must say. Where we, we use many different gestalt or non-gestalt stimuli matched for physical parameters in a simple reaction time paradigm. So we had, uh, you see, many gestalt-like stimuli and uh, many non-gestalt stimuli. They could be presented either bilaterally, the same, same stimulus, or asymmetrically with one good gestalt in one uh, half of the field and a random uh, figure in the other. And we found that uh, in this, with this presentation, well, behavioral is a simple reaction time. Press any time you see something. We didn't find uh, um, relevant uh, uh, behavioral thing. But we found, an import, to us, an important thing that the component N2PC, that for you which are familiar with the word potential, means posterior contralateral, uh, and is actually typical of attentional capture, two stimuli presented to the contralateral part of the visual field. And is obtained by subtracting the component contralateral with the component recorded from the ipsilateral uh, hemisphere. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, highly significant and is uh, represented in parietal uh, let's say occipital parietal area bilaterally because we did uh, both subtraction for one hemisphere and for the other. And, uh, but uh, the advantage uh, for the gestalt form uh, over the non-gestalt uh, was actually, uh, which is the black uh, thing, was actually very uh, clear. So, uh, I think I almost finished. The other thing that I wanted briefly to say is that uh, uh, transient uh, visual evoked potential, in fact, do not have a good literature with uh, amyanopics. Usually, you don't see anything when you, uh, there are exceptions, of course, but uh, uh, clinical, clinical people are always very um, worried about uh, presenting stimuli to the um, ambionopic side. In contrast, there, is, there are hopes for using a steady state visual evoked potential, which uh, have been shown to be more reliable for, in normal, uh, for the diagnosis, for the clinical diagnosis of myanopia. And I don't think they've never been used with blind sight patients. So we are actually doing this now. We have been 
we have done about 10 or a bit less. But we, I'll present you just an example that, uh, of course, you probably know, it's a, the stimuli are uh, oscillating uh, and at a given frequency. And uh, usually we obtain uh, a, a oscillatory responses at the same frequency. And uh, the responses are very robust in primary visual cortex, motion sensitive areas, V3, uh, V4, and so on. This is a very robust effect. And uh, with uh, Javier Sanchez Lopez, who is a Mexican postdoc working with us, Caterina Pedersini, who is here, and uh, from uh, and Silvia Savazzi, and Gina Jue, who is an uh, American, uh, Chinese, French person, very skillful in uh, elaborating data. We have presented the Gabor gratings to the blind field as well as to the other quadrants of the visual field. So let's say this might be only one is oscill oscillating and uh, can be presented either to the, uh, we have a several quadrantanopic patient, by the way, either to the blind field or to the normal field, one at a time. And one patient that I show you just as a clear lesion in occipital cortex, something in the basal ganglia, but he has a quadrantanopia, and presenting the stimulus in the quadrantanopic checked with our personal mapping procedure, and also with retinotopic mapping, you see there is an absence of the dorsal portion of, uh, of V1, whereas in healthy subject uh, we, we get a good retinotopy. And uh, what, what we found is that uh, each of these lines are the, re the response modulated by the stimuli uh, in the four quadrants. And the, uh, the upper, uh, the lower right, which is uh, this one, the well, this one is, uh, or oh, the blue one, I don't remember. Uh, anyway, uh, they are all the same, uh, are widely above the noise level. The noise level is uh, obtained by imposing another uh, frequency, like uh, 13 hertz, and so and sampling from a completely randomized uh, uh, response, of course. So in other words, we found in this and in most of the other patients, this is a responses from the blind field. It's not nothing more specific than that for now, but what what I find is that uh, the is not. I mean, the dark in the blind field is full of, of sparks, and this can be a, an approach which uh, we we will go on uh, using let's say, more interesting stimuli, structural stimuli. And also, it's amenable, of course, to, so you see, for instance, one reassuring thing is that uh, the response of the, the single patient, it's modulated, as you can see, oscillates. So uh, not only in the, in the good quadrant, but also in the, in the lower right, it is black. So, and also we can uh, do some mapping, which is, of course is not very precise with, uh, with uh, evoke potential, but we can also done uh, current sorts. And we found that uh, this patient, but also other, show occipital and frontal activity, both in the intact as well as in the damaged hemisphere. And this is something we have to pursue further, of course. It's not, it's just a simple, uh, taste uh, what we are doing now. And the general conclusion is that the redundant single effect is an indirect uh, non report paradigm has advantages, of course, also disadvantages that there is no subjective report and so on. The capture of automatic attention by gestalt like stimuli occurs very early, probably not only in uh, amyanopic but also in the normal system, starting at the superior colliculus level. One should not be too surprised. We know, we have heard also 
this morning, the superior colliculus has been shown to do very important things. For instance, there is work, the Chinese work, that the cells in the colliculus uh, uh, recognize faces, some other the threatening, uh, several kinds of threatening stimuli. So why not? It's a good station. It's an early station. has a good visual representation. Why not use it for something more important? And the steady state visual evolved potential represents a promising means to study neural activity by el elicited by stimuli in the blind field. More definitive results uh, wait uh, next uh, Larry's anniversary. I promise you, for the next tribute to you, there will be other results. Thank you very much. <laughs>